Okay, we do have plenty of time for a question and answer session for our panelists. Does anybody have any questions to start off with? Yes. It, it was just launched the, the last few weeks, correct? Yes. Yeah. It looks a little, I don't know if you all are familiar with this, but the Clinical Translational Science Group has put together profiles, and it looks a lot like that research gate um, web profile that I put up. And it, it's, in essence, sort of a, a live CV where you would upload your publications in much the same way that um, anyone that you are, that you collaborate with, you can automatically sort of follow them. If you um, if you get on it, right now it's structured by department, so you can go through your department and click on individuals that you're associated with. But yeah, it, it reminded me a lot of ResearchGate, but I didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time on it other than we, uh, our profile popped up and some of our articles and, and um, citations were already in there, but I haven't gone back to sort of revise it or edit it. Is this also tied to the digital measures where we've uploaded a lot of our CV content already? Or is this something in addition to? I think it's, yeah, I think it's in addition to. I don't know if they'll have a link to SAP or digital measures where all of our information is yeah, yeah. And that, you know, and that's the part to me that's sometimes overwhelming <clears throat> is um, coming in, trying just to keep up on a daily basis versus, you know, I don't go to LinkedIn every day and sort of monitor it. Um, the ResearchGate one sends me some nifty emails every now and again if someone that's published in my area pops up, and, and that I really appreciate, and, and we'll go in and check it out. But, um, yeah, it, it's an interesting time and in how fast and how quickly you can actually access or need to access the information. Mm -hmm. Um, Derek, since you bring up digital measures, uh, for those of our audience who, who don't know, could you describe a little bit of, uh, about the content in, in that system, what it's, what it's for, what it does? Certainly, without making any claims about its value, um, it's, a, it's a place that puts the content of a CV in a standard type format. That's what it's supposed to do. So if you want to think about it, if you're a computer scientist, you basically have a database, you're entering data into the fields, and then it's putting the, it's supposed to put the output in a way that would look like a, a traditional or standard CV. The idea, as a cynic, <laughs> is that if you wanted to pull information, so oftentimes as faculty or administrators were asked for information relative to productivity, that that information would be available and you could run reports and it, you wouldn't have to get the 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 to 40 or 50 emails a year that asks you for the same information just put in a different way. Um, and I think we're closer to getting it where it um, will be more user friendly from our you know, staff associates and us to pull data. But uh, I constantly get information on productivity that someone wants it just a slightly different way. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I have several faculty in our department who as soon as we get those requests, I know there's going to be two or three emails in my box that says, can't they just get this from my digital measures? So we're getting there, I think, hopefully. Yes? Um, just on a more tech, like just an individual tech, pragmatic way of looking at it, um, I, I consider myself an early adopter, and I'm in my early 40s, and I, I use a lot of technology, but I find it exhausting to have these multiple profiles in these multiple places. I'm on ResearchGate and LinkedIn. I have a Facebook because younger people that I know are on that. And, you know what I mean? Like, I find it will be a, a bigger time suck even. And do we see any sort of solution to that or any streamlined way of doing that? Because that's a lot of places to be checking in right now. If you use search engines as an example, there was a time when 
I'm going to date myself a little here. Dogpile, Alta Vista. Uh, let's see, this is pre-Google. Netscape. Netscape, right, in terms of the browser. But the place that you would go to search for information was basically a lot like citation counts in that it's looking for numbers of hits. The thing that made Google so exciting was that it was relational. And I think you're going to find one of these systems, I don't know which one, will come to the front. For a long time, I used Netscape. These days, if I don't have Chrome, um, Safari, Netscape on my system, there will be things that I can't access, especially at the university, but other places as well. So personally, I think that there'll be one of these that comes to the fore that says, we'll be the database for you. We'll put it all together so that if a faculty just identifies the people that are in here, assuming that the data are complete and accurate, then you can generate that. That's only my personal opinion. Well, there's the additional problem that, that uh, it, this involves a lot of self-promotion, too, and a lot of activity and putting yourself out into all those places, and not only signing up to LinkedIn, ResearchGate, et cetera, et cetera, and monitoring all that stuff, but putting your information, and uploading your information into those services and, uh, and continuously doing so, and then also uh, spreading and disseminating the information about yourself. So in a very big sense, this is not just an alternative metrics, it's an I metrics kind of a thing, mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, it's a me metrics. Um, and uh, that's gonna be another kind of exhausting, as well as another kind of responsibility that I don't think uh, scholars had to take on in earlier generations, uh, as at least at the scale they, they do or the expectations of them will have today. So. Mm We have a PR person in the College of Health Sciences who will feed information to UK now and, and promote you know things through our um, Facebook page and our, our web page, but not to the level of this. And you know, and as I was reading through some of these materials, I thought, okay, you know, if you're a dean um, in a college, that's something you might start to think about. How best do we promote that information? And I think as a university. Um, at least we've grown a lot from UK now, and, and uh, I've seen as far as getting information out there. And that's why, I, I mean, I just I was trying to put a picture on it, thinking about what is our CV, what's our web page is going to look like in the future, and to, to go back to your question, I mean, it might have two or three of the most cool, pertinent, vital metric aggregators listed. I mean, I, you know, obviously you can't have 15 or 20 of them and try to make sense of them, so I agree that someone's going to come out probably up top. Gentlemen on this side. No, no, I'm just telling here. I mean, Derek and I have some stats just about that. <laughs> I'm going to pick the history of the web. In fact, has been a hmm. for at least five years here, maybe even more so because of the conflict between publishers and search engines mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. that part of it. Gentleman right behind Dr. Keller, have you? Thank you. As someone said earlier, science is communication, and you can get a lot of buzz from talking about a very poorly written paper. Exactly. Or excellent paper is what you're doing. Uh, would it perhaps be more accurate to say that all metrics would be a better measure of a journal's ability to market itself and its content successfully than an individual paper? You were talking about the budget of uh, nature science and other journals here. So that's probably a factor. Um, 
So not only is, is it going to be the responsibility of the author, but also the ability of the publisher to, to disseminate that kind of information and spread it around. Um, I was thinking about things that are aggregate rather than paper sure. print. Yeah. Well, that's what an impact factor is, right? That unit of analysis is really the journal, not the article. And some of what we're talking about, the unit of analysis, is the author, where it's looking at everything combined. So. so I think it's more than that because you're talking about the, the war room college or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion about papers that never has an impact on something that I might write about, but I might talk to someone about. Right. Um, in the case of the students that are writing about it, it, it all goes three or four people deep sometimes in conversation. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the the advantages of uh, gathering metrics that are broader is that you you can learn something very interesting about what's being discussed. Whether the question for me that I'm interested in is is whether it should be used for uh, as a measure of impact. So it's neat, I think, to know how people are tweeting and who's tweeting or blogging or the like, and if uh, whether you know I would like to differentiate between my family being very excited about a publication that I've made and uh, you know, someone in my field probably maybe or maybe not excited about something I published. You know? um, it's, it would be good to have that kind of different, different uh, that kind of specifics. We don't have that, we don't necessarily have those kind of specifics in a citation only network either. I mean a citation count is a citation count whether it's positive or negative. Um, there's, there's a there's some evidence that suggests that the kind of qualitative information these alternative metrics services can provide would help you know, provide that kind of information, that kind of discernment. Um, but whether it should be used to assess somebody's impact is an entirely different question, largely because the greater variety of sources that are being used to pull that information in. So you know, the, the more variance, the, less, the greater the uncertainty kind of mm -hmm. a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so who's, t I know when I'm cited, I know that it's somebody, it's a, it's a scholar of some sort that's citing me, you know, because the index, whether science, Scopus, or even Google Scholar will largely stick to that domain. But when I'm, you know, when these other areas are being pulled to assess my impact, um, I may or may not know in the aggregate, at least, you know, some of these issues. Question in front? Yeah. I want to come back to something Dr. Wayne said about just because we put it, if we make it available, doesn't necessarily mean it's accessible. And one of the things that I, I found interesting about this conversation is one of the questions um, that we've never really addressed is why open access then? I mean, if this stuff is ultimately inaccessible to the general public, and most academics will have access to their libraries, <laughs> what, you know, why are we doing this? What are we, and, and again, the same thing with all metrics. What are we measuring this for other than tenure and promotion? You know, and, and, and I think that that's, I mean, it's sort of the underlying question that we never got to. We're sort of taking mm -hmm. open access. And I'm not knocking open access, but the way we're kind of talking about it is it's still very much closed network. You know, it's just more free and will cost the libraries less money in certain regards. You know, so I, I wonder if you guys could address that a little bit, because I know Dr. Burns, you're talking about wanting to, your research to have an impact with practitioners, clinicians, who might not have access, but also, you know, might not necessarily um, be able to access those, uh, that kind of language at high level as well. So I, I was just wondering if anyone could um, speak to that. I'm sorry, I got back to my question for a little yeah, bit. There is there, this is being this is take, there is a reason why this is taking place this discussion in, in uh, open access week it is within the larger conversation of not just open access but there are conversations about open science open humanities open citations citations are often locked up into uh, um, proprietary databases without access so Google Scholar even I believe has to pay journals for access to the reference list because those are copyrighted. Uh, and open access is not just uh, an issue of the web, it's also an issue of copyright too, because um, there's no such thing as open access in the print-only world, which is a web issue, but there's also uh, no such thing as a, it's not a copyright issue unless you can disseminate freely, or make copies, you know, control C, control D, you know, you know endlessly. So, um, 
So all metrics depends on open access, and it depends on open a lot of things um, for it to even work, because you're not being able to, it depends on APIs, for example, being able to interface with Twitter and Facebook uh, programmatically. Um, so, you know, you know, that in consideration, you know, without, you know, this larger open access, open source, open standards uh, framework in place, you know, this is, it's just not even possible you know, so to even have these discussions. Can I just have a, a follow-up question? I guess this is, this is the other question I'm kind of getting at, too, um, is this idea of um, why are we doing and publishing this research? You know what I mean? Like, Because, mm -hmm. again, one of the things that this, these conversations are about, should we use this as gender promotion? Should we use this for... Um, uh, you know, hiring, should we use this for productivity? Are we doing a good job? And that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, it, it, it sort of, you know, is this, and, and obviously it isn't, but when the, I find when the conversation gets narrowed down into this focus, it becomes a question of it seems that this is the only reason we do this research. You know, and I know that that's not the yeah. question, but certainly some of the underlying conversation that takes place with this and with the traditional citation uh, impact, it, it becomes a conversation of, who are we doing this research for? What are we doing mm -hmm. this research for? Why are we publishing this research? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and so maybe that's, that's something that you have to I th well, I, I think it's an interesting, I hadn't thought of it that way, so I give you a lot of credit to narrow it down, but I was looking at it from more of a purist standpoint of if that data is out there, obviously um, businesses and industry knows how to use it very well because wherever I go, the last time I looked up a flashlight when I popped back up online, there's a flashlight ad. <laughs> so yeah. obviously yeah. someone is, is monitoring this data really well. And I think if, yeah, so if the, um, uh, if the impact of, of, let's just say, from rehab or medicine or uh, uh, treatment is out there, then that probably has multiple uh, potential impacts. Companies might find that more impactful. Individuals, you know, I don't know where that information will be shared, but if you were a young scholar, you know, we say go and pick up the end of a journal article and see what future considerations might be. It might change in several years where people are looking at things that are more impactful and how they're aggregated to say, wow, this is an area where I think is worth studying. It might be areas that we have um, uh, different curriculum you know, where we start to look at different majors and minors and areas where we combine, um, you know, if you're thinking multidisciplinary. So I could, I was thinking of it more from that aspect versus just the evaluation of, uh, uh, you know, faculty. Does, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. for me, at, at a research one, if you distinguish those from a regional or a standalone master's program somewhere, there's an expectation that what we're doing is creating new knowledge. That's why we're here. Um, most faculty, half of their time is devoted to that. And so I was worried, actually, when they put the panel together, I didn't know if we were going to go point-counterpoint on this. Because I'm like, I'm not really supposed to be the fan, am I? I hope I'm not. <laughs> but I'm, I'm a fan of data if it's meaningful, right? So the focus was really more about the research impact and what that means. Because you could talk about social impact, you could talk about economic impact. Here we're talking about does the research that's being published have an impact. Um, it doesn't get published if somebody doesn't believe it has an impact. And it's usually those gatekeepers who are the journal editors and who are the reviewers saying, no, this does not constitute enough uh, value, enough impact to take up space in the journals. Question in the back? Oh, somewhere else. Somewhere else. And I don't know if that's true for, for other disciplines or not, but at the same I mean, agriculture. At the same time, our journal is giving us the option now we can make papers open access for an official report. That's just how that costs. And so I guess my question is partly is that the old dog just barking at a at a new toy coming in? Or is there a point when open access will overtake what we currently have in our system? Because 
So societies are set up, the, the publications and such are set up to be the gatekeepers that you mentioned mm -hmm. in that regard. And, and when you turn around to open access, you, your, your source of gatekeepers is on who they are, not as concrete as you will. Does that explain that very well? Yeah, yeah. I, personally, I don't have the crystal ball that I would love to have. But if you talk to the music industry about those shifts and those changes, um, even 20 years ago, and look at what's going on today around intellectual property, around dissemination of, I mean, there are uh, musicians that basically go directly to the public. They don't go through uh, any gatekeeper, right? Any screen. Now, if you've heard some of that music, you probably realize why that's the case. But there's also some good stuff out there as well. So, I don't know. Okay. There's a, there's, there's, I'm, I have, I would bet my life on it almost if I was a betting person to um, say that Peter Suber will talk about this tomorrow. But the difference, there's a difference here between gold open access and green open access. You can continue publishing in whatever journal you please, um, whether it's open access, whether it's not, whether it's uh, prestigious or not. Uh, and then take the preprint or postprint of that article and deposit it into a, a repository like UK Knowledge that's hosted here. Uh, and then you've made that accessible to anybody, um, whether they have access or subscribe to that journal. And this is also, in a way, a social justice issue. So third world countries, for example, who cannot afford the anywhere from two to twenty, thirty thousand dollars subscription fee for some of these journals, especially in the health sciences will not have access to that content um, as long as they have internet access, which is another issue too. Um, but uh, so an open and green OA is, so is a viable, it, it's not going to be dependent then on whatever journals or prestigious. Despite that, there is growing a uh, number of articles that are journals that are, that use a gold OA model that are are more prestigious. I'm not sure. It's going to vary by discipline. You know. uh, PLOS one, for example, in the biosciences are very important to the biosciences. Pure J is, even though it's in its first year, seems to be making remarkable uh, progress and, and uh, gained a lot of esteem for its work. Um, and a lot of this actually is is mostly relevant to the life sciences. It's, this is probably a factor of NIH funding and all the money that goes into that kind of research. Um, but there's always green OA, so, and, and that respects a, an academic's freedom to publish where they would like uh, and still make the content accessible so you can avoid having to publish in a questionable journal. But there are librarians out there. Uh, there's one whose name is Jeffrey Bill who um, compiles a list of uh, questionable open access publishers, so not only open access publishers that are less prestigious, but ones that are um, uh, somewhat, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so there are a number of sources. And, uh, really with library, this is one of the ways that librarians are leading the charge for the future and responding to a lot of the uh, communication problems that the web has introduced. So. Oh, thank you, Sean. <laughs> In the back. Would you? Would you say it's the case, perhaps, then, that the barbarians are at the gate on both ends of the castle, and that with the uh, with the sting operation by science and pulling out uh, those OAs that are not so high, the ones that are uh, mm -hmm. and then also looking at the way in which traditional publishers are having uh, having an answer to call, and um, I don't know enough about whether or not their open access forays are, are, are worthy of anything to talk about, but. That it sort of comes, and then perhaps we're going to get to a spot where our decisions about impact are going to be one of whether who we as scholars want to impact, and then we'll make selections based upon where we go visit and mm -hmm. walk in and where we care to be. I think we're also sort of so much is going on that there's almost a false urgency, I would say, for us to sort of be everywhere, and I think that's sad because I think we should still push for it forward and push where we think our communities are going to grow. It's been said, and there's been fragmentation, but. Sure. So, so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that sting is 
that um, the sting is about uh, research that was conducted where somebody submitted, it was recent, like two weeks ago, the one you're referring to, where a researcher uh, sent out false papers to a number of journals that uh, accepted some of the fake, fake uh, journals. This is not the first. Yeah. Right. Including Nelson, yeah. yeah. Um, um, so that's, that's what I find about Dr. Lane's re, uh, uh, comment about peer review being the most important gatekeeping device that we have. Uh, a lot of the criticism is against peer review. And so uh, what can the web do, for example, to respond to that kind of criticism or offer, as technologically at least, and that the open peer review has been the most common uh, response. Um, so, I mean... Yeah, as a journal editor, yeah. yeah my, my thought is that the, the access to information continues to expand. <clears throat> you know, whether it's PubMed Central. Um, so when I hear people say that they have no access, or if they have the web, they have access to you know most the, the, most things that people in in large research institutions have. You may not have access to all of it, but the availability of at least searching it and pulling an abstract uh, is there. So. Uh, I think I worry about some of the open access journals, particularly you know with the with the issue with cancer, this cancer paper. Um, that it, peer review is important. There has to be some sort of gatekeeper to judge uh, science. Otherwise, I think the other advantage of social media and web pages and uh, research lab pages is you have the opportunity to present what you're doing and sort of create your own open access. Um, so yeah, I think it, it, you know, it's, a, it's a touchy area. I know my, I mean, I, my journal is with a company or publisher called Human Kinetics and it's relatively small, but we have taken a lot of steps to make uh, information more accessible. And we've taken several papers, um, types of papers in our journal that we provide free of charge just so that we can provide some of that information and, and make people more aware of what's being done Many of those are clinical type papers. So I, I think, you know, in the future that journals have to say, how are we going to be competitive and how can we get our information out there? Uh, and I think those that are supported from societies, those are supported from large groups, um, you know, the AMP, JAMA and some <coughs> of the like, they're going to always continue to, to have the ability to propagate more information than others. Just a quick follow up. This conversation certainly centered on the academic work of scholars while we talk about impact and wanting to impact the policy or the field, we are in direct competition with say think tanks and white papers that go out as well. Mm -hmm. And in the education policy circles there is one group that you just called out of and that is a think twice think tank project where they're taking think tank papers and exposing them for lack of rigor or other aspects that might not stand up to what we would accept as proper peer review. Mm -hmm. Question in the front. Um, I heard a lot, uh, particularly from Dr. Matakola and Dr. Lane, about using altmetrics not in opposition to the traditional uh, measures of impact factor, but sort of additionally. And I was curious because a lot of the altmetrics that were discussed today seem so user driven, um, driven by the author specific to the article itself, its content, rather than like macro journal level, mm -hmm. whether there has been pushback, what kind of pushback there's been from traditional publishers when all the traditional measurement paradigms have been about the journal, whereas we're now sort of moving the focus away from that. Um, yeah, th let me think about that for a second. The, so your journal impact factor is going to be relative to how many times something cited. <clears throat> if you uh, put out a successful paper, meaning that it's cited a lot of times, and I shouldn't have said successful, you put out a paper that's cited quite a bit in your field and people use it, that still comes back to you as an author. You know, I think some of the metrics like ResearchGate and some of the others, your H indexes, if you're looking at right. individual indexes will say how often has your paper been cited and over time you know does that continue to build so I think those are um, used in combination with some of the alt metrics are still driven from the profession and from the scholarly community 
I only used the individual as a potential um, white flag or red flag to, to, you know, to keep an eye on. Um, I think most researchers, while they would like and scholars would like to get their information out, they're, I, and I say this carefully, are not probably egomaniacs that they're going to sit at home every night and tweet this uh, for hours upon time. hours upon yeah. hours. Yeah. I, I do think if they were interested in sharing it, they'd share it in, in their group. And as, um, as that grows, just like anything on the Internet nowadays, that, that would proliferate if it was something that uh, extended beyond disciplines and might get picked up, if it was something that was clinically um, you know, useful that the common layperson would find would be, you know, that that would continue to propagate. And that, I think, is really exciting. I mean, I think that part is particularly cool. Um, and I also think, you know, from the standpoint of internationally being able to share information like that, that that's often a negative of a journal. Now, in defensive journals, they have tried really hard to get information out faster and faster. I mean, we are putting, you know, pre-publication uh, papers up uh, at a much quicker rate than we used to in the past, and most are. So, you know, I think the idea of providing the information to the reader and to the readership is is there. Yeah, I didn't I didn't mean that. Uh, I, I look at it the same way that if if um, uh, if you pick up somebody's paper, and out of twenty reference, they reference themselves five or six or seven or eight times, you sometimes have to wonder. Okay, is there? Are you the only person in the field, and is it justified? Or is it that you're trying to build your own sort of reference CV because you find it helpful to, to put it out there? What's interesting about that is that it, that's only even a consideration where um, citations are used for impact. Mm -hmm. you know, if, uh, if citations weren't used as a measure for impact, who would care how many times somebody self exactly. Um And I'm not sure NIH or NSF are going to let you, you know, here's my research gate number, and so because I have this, fund my research. I don't see a time where that's going to happen at least soon. The interesting part of that is that uh, the altmetrics, um, at least a couple of the uh, researchers who are spearheading this have received several hundreds of thousands of dollars in uh, funding from uh, various agencies, governmental and nonprofit, in, uh, in advancing this. Okay, we still have time for one more question. All questions answered. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>